Hello everybody, it's Mrs. Summerlin and I'm going to go over your research paper outline to help you get started. Well first of all you need to know that an APA research paper is all about the facts and convincing. So it's all about informing and persuading. So you don't want any fluff, no fluff, and you don't want anything fancy, sort of over the top, no fanciness. You need to write to the point directly without without any distractors. So I've given you this outline down here to sort of help you through this issue. And I'm just going to go through and add some annotations to it because as you know, you should annotate everything. All right, so your introduction should be longer than a typical ICE introduction, an in-class essay introduction. You want it to be maybe about six sentences or so. Um, that is a pretty good length, but by, by no means is that a rule. Just try to get it to at least six sentences, not a full page, but a hefty paragraph. You don't want any rhetorical questions because those are lame. I know that some people love starting with rhetorical questions, but your, your business in this paper is not to ask questions. Your business is to state your opinion and back it up with facts. So no rhetorical questions. Also, sometimes quotes and definitions are ways that people start these papers and those are very cliche and boring and I expect more of you at this point. I think um, you should maybe try a short story called an anecdote and when I say a short story I mean really short or even a discussion like a mini discussion which is what I do on the back of this paper I'll show you when we get there a mini discussion. Um, you're going to want to have, remember that your thesis needs to be debatable, you're proving something, so you want this to use debatable words like best or most, like most efficient, like the most efficient method to teach kindergartners their phonics is blank because blank and blank. So use that debate language, best, most, preferable. Uh, and when you transition, this is just a very brief statement that is about your next point. People struggle with transitions a lot. My way of covering transitions is to say um, it's a little bit of the paragraph you just talked about with a hint, a preview of what you're discussing or the link between them. Thesis to issue. Now, in a research paper, it's always good to have a paragraph that is just about your issue, where you give terms or definitions or any of the jargon that someone reading your paper is going to need to know. So that's what this bullet point, this paragraph number two is here. Um, you need to have a strong statement, so you need to have your assertion. This is your issue. What are you saying? What's your assertion? And then you need to educate your readers a little bit. I might need to know what a term for physical therapy is or your reader might not understand what common core standard is if you're doing a teaching thing. You need to educate your readers to make sure everybody's on level. You need to do this also without sounding condescending so just be very straightforward. In your number three here state your case number point, point one. This is going to um, be a strong statement you have, a strong point. It needs to start with this assertion. You need to support your your assertion with citations. You need to discuss the value of your evidence, value or significance. And then you need to repeat, like rinse and repeat, as much as necessary. You always need more evidence. You want more evidence and more discussion. You should never be including evidence without also discussing why that evidence is valid or important. Uh, it is important to note here that you can f discuss your opposition first, if you would like. You can begin with the opposition. Um, I actually suggest starting with the opposition if you have a hot button topic.
So if you have a really controversial issue, say, for instance, I know one of you is doing feminism. That's a very controversial issue at this moment. And I would start with the opposition in that case. You need to knock that ball out of the park as soon as possible. And you always want to discuss the opposition because if you don't acknowledge the other side of the case, then someone can, can assume that you just didn't know about that side. You want to let your reader say, no, I know about the other side. I just think they're wrong. State your case number two. This is going to be your strongest paragraph. Oh, no, this is going to be your weakest paragraph. So it could be a sub point or just a really weak piece of evidence. Sometimes we have two really good pieces of evidence and one of them that's just kind of good. Put your kind of good per evidence here. You want your weakest point in the middle so it's sandwiched between two so strong points. It might be a shorter paragraph. All right, number five is going to involve your strongest point. This is your absolute best piece of evidence. You want it down here at the end because you're wrapping up your case. You've already got your, your audience on your side. You've used all your rhetorical strategies. You're there. You're going to make this into a big, beefy paragraph, maybe even two paragraphs. You might want to break the paragraph somewhere so it's not super long. But just break it in a smart place. This is your best reason. Um, then opposition. Again, if you don't not acknowledge the opposition, that's bad. If you don't acknowledge them, then you don't have an argument. You have to at least acknowledge them just so that they know you are aware of the other side and you're aware that it's incorrect. You need to tell them why they're wrong and why you're right. So here, it's just another way of being persuasive. I always say you must destroy them. Completely annihilate their argument. And then down here at the end, you need to have the most important thing is to restate your point. This is not your thesis. You just need to cover all your points again in a sentence or two. You need to call us to action. What are we supposed to do? Suggest further action for us. Give us a plan or a goal. And then have a snappy conclusion. You want this to tie back to your thesis. So if you do tell a story in your thesis, this is a way to come back to your thesis. Like, and I'm going to show you on the back. Okay, so on the other side of your outline is a completed outline. This is one that I wrote about teenagers and the death penalty. I wrote it some years ago, but I think it's still applicable to the situation. I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, so your hook here, I have here the story of this man, this boy actually. His name is Marcus Graverly, who was on death row. And so this is a very shocking start. It's like, oh my goodness, a 13-year-old on death row is something that you want to think about. My assertion here is a part of my thesis. An assertion is just a statement without facts. So teenagers should not be subjected to the death penalty regardless of the crime. That's what I'm going to cover. That's my assertion. Plus, because, reason number one, the teenage brain does not mature until the age of 25. Check. Reason two, teenage brains are being bombarded with hormones. Check. Reason three, teenagers may not have had the opportunity to grow up in a home which reinforced appropriate behavior. So I'm going to talk about maturity, hormones, and bad home life as reasons why teenagers should not be susceptible to the death penalty. I transition from this idea. I'm going to discuss legal terms next. So I'm discussing legal issues here, criminalized, modern science, psychology. I get down to defining the issue and I say, okay, what I mean by crime is this. Crimes committed by teenagers are on the rise. I realize this is a problem. So I have a little bit of my concession here. But I also talk about psychological, emotional, and environmental issues which impact their judgment. And I'm going to say, okay, when I mean physiological problems, I mean this. When I mean emotional problems, I mean this. When I mean environmental problems, I mean this. 
And here is also a place for defining, like define hormone. I need to define that. I need to give some statistics of how much crime is on the rise, how much crime is committed by teenagers. So this is going to be a place for me to just get some background info. And then this links to my first major point here. So I'm talking about science and brain development. My first point is about brain development. So I'm going to lead with this this topic sentence, teenage brains have not fully developed yet, and as such, teenagers cannot be held completely responsible for all of their actions. The death penalty should not apply because it is not completely their fault. And so that's my statement, and now I'm going to have research from MCG. I'm going to discuss it. Refer research from Harvard, discuss. Research for Young, discuss. And I'm going to mingle and mix my sources. If I only use one source, that's not a very good persuasive argument. But if I mingle them and I mix them up, then I can prove, hey, I'm not the only one that thinks this. It's me and MCG and Harvard and Young. So there's lots of things going on here that are proving my point, not just one article, because one article might be written by a weirdo, but not all three articles. All right, then I move into my second point and my third point. You might notice by now that I am missing my opposition. I am sorry I ran out of room. But my opposition would be something like, oh, teenagers are violent, they know right from wrong, they understand the law, but, remember that but is always important, but, yes, they know right from wrong, yes, they understand the law, but their brain is not finished developing. Yes, they know right from wrong, but they have impulse controls because they are being bombarded with these chemicals that affect their behavior. Yes, they know right from wrong, or do they? They may have grown up in a home that did not emphasize right from wrong. So that's what I mean by opposition. And you just break them down point by point. It's very systematic. Now, conclusion down here. This is restate the thesis. Notice that I did not say the same thing all over again. I mixed it all up. And it's not a thesis. It's a lot chunkier than a thesis. Um, then down here, I have that conclusion, which ties back to my thesis. So it's too late for some of America's youth, like that guy in the hook, the 13-year-old Marcus Graverly who's on death row. Um, but others can be saved. Here's my call to action. Americans need to stand up and make sure that legislators know, realize the truth about the teenage brain. So that's what I'm telling people to do. Be aware when you go out and vote. And then this is my clincher. Okay? So moving on very quickly, because I only have about three minutes, to that second paper here. This is your example. The example is Katie Chancellor. I taught her a couple years ago. She's a great student. She's a very sweet person. Um, she allowed me to use this document to sort of teach. If we zoom in a little bit, you can see some of my comments out here to the side. I've tried to be as straightforward as possible in these comments. Um, your short title is what you're putting up here. That's that short title. So your short title is going to be the same. A picture says a thousand words. After the colon, you put a more specific title. So a picture says a thousand words, colon, photography's role in modern day lives. You can do nursing too. So for instance, the one I'm using is um, the dangers, the, uh, nursing, nursing stress, colon, the dangers of an 18 hour day. So it's just a, a, a more specific, fancier kind of title. Um, over here she has, if you follow the outline, she does exactly what uh, the outline does. You need your title again. A lot of people leave this off. Your title is going to be repeated a lot. She starts with a story here about a child sitting on a curb and she moves into this big idea. She's got her thesis here. This is her overall argument. This is what she's going to prove. That photography is the best avenue for raising awareness more so than PSAs or commercials. And so if you move through this, it gives you discussions about how to cite, how to get started, if you can't read these comments, please ask me and I will clarify them for you. I have truncated, that's a word you should probably look up, AP children. This paper has been truncated, but yours will be a full five pages. And I've done some math for you down here. You know how I love math. One cover page plus five pages of text plus one references page equals your senior project research paper. So it needs to be, it needs to be a f like seven pages long at the minimum. Over here, I've given you an example of some references as well. Your references should look exactly like this. In fact, if you take the references from your annotated bib and fix them, you should have exactly what you need. I know this was very quick, and I have seven seconds left, but if you have any questions, please let me know. I am always here for you.